Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Paddy de Gutsko. I work at uh, Siemens based in uh, Berlin in uh, Germany. And I was asked today to talk about the top topic ports and uh, maritime logistics trends uh, to you. I have worked um, the last 13 years of my professional career in this sector uh, on ports and uh, maritime uh, logistics. And uh, currently, I work at uh, the sector infrastructure and cities within Siemens. At Siemens, we have four different sectors. Uh, one of them is industry, the second is health, a third is energy, and the fourth new sector is infrastructure and cities. And within this sector, infrastructure and cities, we focus on uh, logistics hubs like, for example, ports, airports, uh, railroads, um, and uh, roads. So I'm happy to be here today and uh, talk to you about sports and uh, maritime um, trends. This is the agenda uh, for today. I will talk about a uh, type of different marine uh, ports, stakeholder models, um, top board ports, then board trade flows, US ports, and also talk a bit about the expansion of the Panama Canal and uh, the impact of the expansion on the trade uh, flows in America. Topic one type of uh, marine ports. I will talk about the multiple ports and single purpose ports, and then also a bit about the layout of ports. Here we see we have um, two types of uh, ports. We, we have inland ports. They are located next to rivers. Further, we have uh, ports. They are located at harbors. Here we differentiate between multiple purpose ports and single purpose ports. Single purpose ports ports mean that they, have, they just deal with one of those commodities which you see here. Multi-purpose ports, they have different type of commodities, commodities in their ports. So they have container terminal ports, dry bulk, row row. Row row means you um, ship cars from one port to the next port, liquid bulk, ferries. We have around about 8,200 ports worldwide. And most ports, you find them in Europe and in North America. So you need different equipment once you have a different type of uh, ports. For example, for liquid bulk, you need pipelines. For container terminals, you need, uh, as you see here, ship to shore cranes or RTGs or RMGs. I will show the equipment later during the show. And for dry bulk, for example, you need conveyor belts. So the equipment really differs depending on type of ports. Topic two is about processes, technologies, and KPIs, which are relevant for ports. As from here, I will just focus on container ports, because I think container ports, this is where we see the most growth worldwide in investments in ports. It's not in other type of ports. It will be in container ports. And this is the reason why I will just focus on container ports. Here you see the process in a container terminal. The vessel arrives at the key site, and then here you have ship to shore equipment. And here in the middle, you have the stacking area, so the transfer area. And then you have the rail and road connection to the hinterland. This is the very simple process which you find in a port. Here we see different equipment which you need in terminals. So the unloading process, it indicates which containers should be unloaded and in which hold they are situated in a ship. Successfully, these containers are unloaded in contrast with the unloading process. There is hard flexi flexibility in the loading process. At the operational level, you have a stowage planning. 
a storage plan indicates for each container the exact place on the ship. So containers with the same desti destination, category, weight, size, they belong to the same category. Sometimes only for each category the positions in the ship are given. And the aim is always to avoid un unnecessary moves because this is what costs a lot, the moves. Transport of the container from the ship to shore site to the stacking area happens with these different kinds of equipment. So with uh, ship to shore cranes, and um, we have here single twin tandem and also uh, triple ship to shore uh, cranes. And then here in this field, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's here in the middle, in the stacking area. I don't find the red point. So uh, you work with RNGs and RTGs, so rail-mounted gantry cranes or rubber-tired gantry cranes. In the middle, between the ship-to-shore crane and the stacking area, the trend is to deal and to work with AGVs. This is automated guided vehicles, and they are normally out, uh, with battery driven, so they are very sustainable. And these are the AGVs here. So they cost a lot, around about 500,000 euros in dollar, I don't know. Um, but they are very expensive, but um, two, or it is around about 12 terminals worldwide, they have these AGVs. Here you see different indicators which are normally used in order to get efficient in, efficient in a terminal. For example, the vessel turn around time, the first point. This is an important indicator for the produ productivity of a terminal and it indicates the vessel standing time at a port. For example, in Singapore, the standing time in a port is around about 12 to 24 hours. But in India, you have standing and waiting times from 37 to 50 hours in the port. So it differs really from region to region and from port to port. Also, other uh, criteria like cargo damage rate are important indicators. And also gross moves per hour. So this is the moves which the STS cranes need in order to handle with the uh, containers uh, indicates the crane productivity and also the truck turn around time. This is the average uh, time which the truck spends in the port and also housekeeping moves or KPIs which shows the number of moves carried out at the stacking area. During the planning process also the cargo dwell time is very important which calculates the average time goods spent in the port storing area and vessel waiting time, which is the total time which the vessel takes to reach in its uh, mooring berth from the time it calls. The next topic is about stakeholder models. So I will talk about different types of ownership models at ports. So we have one type is the 100% state-owned operated uh, port. Then we have uh, here leased model. Leased model, other name is also the land port model. In this model, the port infrastructure is owned by the port authority, and the port authority is also in charge of the management of the port. But the port services, is uh, done through the terminal operators. So ports like, for example, Buenos Aires in Argentina or Rotterdam, Netherlands, they belong to this landlord port, to these leased terminal ports. Other model is a concession port. Other name for it is, for example, tool port. As in the landlord model, port authorities, they own also the infrastructure, but in this mode of organization, they also own the superstructure, also the buildings and the equipment like the cranes. And private firms, they provide services by renting port assets through concessions or licenses. 
Other uh, model is the 100% privately owned. It is the service port. In this model, port authorities, they are responsible for a port as a whole. So they own the infrastructure and the superstructure. And they hire employees in order to provide services themselves directly. One of uh, examples is, for example, the port of Singapore. It is a 100% privately owned port. Here we see in a stakeholder overview. One of the main stakeholders is uh, the port authority. So they are um, responsible to provide access to the port and build the infrastructure like streets, roads, the key site, but also they address env environmental impacts and environmental issues. Like, for example, in Port of LA, they are responsible to reduce the emissions in the ports. So the Port Authority res is responsible for this topic. Other important stakeholder is the terminal operator. So they do the operations in the terminal itself. Here we see the very complex structure of different stakeholders. Solution providers who provide, for example, the TOS. This is the terminal operating IT system in a container terminal. And also crane automation and control systems. We need further integrators who integrate all the equipment, for example, the RTGs, the SDEs, and RMGs and straddle carriers with the TOS. And we need, for example, constructors who plan and prepare master plannings and documents. So topic four is about the trends in the global container industry. I will talk about main observed uh, trends in ports. We have done a survey on behalf of Siemens. And what we have identified through these surveys is that we see that there is an increasing traffic volumes and the introduction of bigger container vessels. This will put pressure on terminals and also on the infrastructure. And the high number of traffic volumes and also the bigger ves vessels, they will lead to congestion in the port, but also in the hinterland of the ports. This will lead to more automation of operations, and as we see that ports, they ask also for more management systems, so total port management systems, more IT systems, which they need in order to optimize the processes. What we see further is extended uh, gateway concepts at uh, seaports. This is um, an option to improve the accessibility and connectivity of the seaports with the hinterlands network. Further, we see also the horizontal and vertical, vertical integration. This means that shipping lines try to um, build alliances, which include also terminal operations. Further trend is security and environment. This gets more and more important, so reducing of CO2 emissions and OX and also, the, for example, the clean truck program, which we have seen at the port of uh, LA. And also, terminals ask for more and more for onshore power supply for their vessels. Here we see some political trends in container ports. Major political trend which we see is the shortage of public budgets. And there is a necessity to attract private capital to better develop the ports. So we see more and more privatization trends for port operations. This has impact on private investments, not only in operations, but also in the infrastructure. The investment decision-taking process also takes place more and more through private entities. So economic trends, which we see here, current forecasts of uh, GDP per capita, they show rising levels of wealth, for example, in BRIC countries. The increasing number of container goods leads to pressure for continuous improvement and efficiency in terminals, 
because there is a need of more capacity and, uh, in the terminals and sufficient hinterland access. So terminal operators need to invest more in equipment and infrastructure and need demand and they ask for automated terminals. What we see here are the social trends. So the f new phenomena is not in my backyard. What we, see, what we have seen, for example, in Port of Helsinki, which is in Europe, they have uh, transferred the, their old port from the center outside of the city and have invested a lot and moved the whole port from the inner city to outside in order to build a uh, space and make capacity free to build uh, residential areas in the city. This is a trend which we see also at ports. Concerning technological uh, trends, because of increasing cargo volumes and automated container handling projects, for example, the expansion also of the 2014 Panama Canal expansion, um, this is a driver for private facility investments. The impacts are that they offer efficient hinterland, efficient hinterland intermodal transport system, and here we see the necessity of cooperation between stakeholders. The impact on terminal operations is increasing number of peaks in terminals and also more investment in IT systems, which are more intelligent and optimize also the stacking area in the terminal and minimizing the handling moves in the terminal. Concerning legal trends, uh, trends we see here um, there was um, a law signed through the President of the United States in 2007. The law name is House Re uh, Resolution Number no. 1, w Act of 2007. This law aims at strengthening the security of American air and sea lanes. And this will have, uh, have impact on suppliers concerning demand for cameras, fences, and um, new technologies in terminals. As far as terminal um, trends, so terminal operators are more and more under uh, pressure in order to improve their efficiency and increase security and reduce their labor costs. So they look in automated technologies to help to achieve their goals. Today's gate technologies, for example, enable terminal operators to do more with less, with improving turn times, reducing truck emissions, and improving customer services. So the key to success is seamless integration with existing terminal operating systems. Today, technologies, they allow you to move gate clerks from the gate to an office to process transactions using automated data collection devices, such as, for example, RFID readers, OCR cameras and biometrics. What we see further, for example, in um, Port of Hamburg, the AGVs, so here, the AGVs which are used, they also reduce the air pollution in the port. So these are trends in terminals. So we as Siemens, we are also taking a look at um, new container handling uh, equipment. What we see at APM terminals are uh, concepts like, for example, Fastnet. We as Siemens are thinking about crane grid concepts. So this is a grid, and then cranes move automatic automatically within these uh, grids. And uh, what we see is that terminals invest more and more also in stacking equipments, also in horizontal transport. And the aim for terminals is for sure to reduce the pollution and uh, use more electric drive technologies or battery-driven uh, technologies. Here I would like to explain about the shippers and shippers' decision-taking ta uh, criteria. 
So factors which affect uh, shipping companies' port choice are, for example, for sure, uh, the costs of terminal handling charges. So uh, the terminal handling charge is one of the most important factors. This is the cost which is very important to the shipping lines. But the number of services which are offered also at different ports, like feeder connections, is also important to shipping lines. And also the productivity at the terminal, like, for example, vessel waiting times at the port. And also shippers take a look also at the expansion plans at the port. So what do a port really plan in long term until 2020, 2035? Also, the services in the hinterland also very, are very important to the shipping lines and then they decide if they sign a contract with a terminal for a period of five or six years or not. Here I would like to show a ranking of um, world ports. What we see here is that most top world ports, they are based in Asia. So Port of Singapore has, for example, a, a yearly throughput of 25 million toy. And what we see here is the uh, growth worldwide. So Drury is a consultancy office uh, in England, and they do always the forecasting for uh, ports. So from 2009, 476 million toy worldwide, the volume will increase to 845 million toy in 2016. And most uh, growth, it will occur in East, um, in Far East with, 30, uh, with 350 million toy in 2016. Here I would like to focus on container traffic and the um, utilization rate of the terminals. So what we see here, uh, Drury estimates the global container growth of uh, roughly 6 to 8 percent per year. Interesting is here the capacity utilization over time. So in 2050, we see 2015, we see that most terminals will have a capacity utilization rate of around 80%. This means there is a need of investment in, in terminals. If we take a look at the container handling uh, capacity, this is here in Middle East and Far East, we have already, uh, we will reach in 2015 a container handling capacity of 96% in Far East and Middle East. This means most investment will occur in Middle East and Far East because they have already reached their capacities. This slide shows the utilization at most terminals worldwide, and we see that the utilization is very high. Many terminals work at their capacity limits already, and we see, for example, that 66 um, terminals show most throughput of more than 135 million toy. The toy is TEU, and um, the utilization level at this terminal is more than 90%. There will be soon also a need for customers for uh, new technologies and better terminal perf performance through birth productivity and increasing of yard throughput. Within the next slides, I will explain the port uh, the factors which drive the demand for investments in the infrastructure and um, what, for example, World Bank thinks, uh, how much investment is needed worldwide in ports. So uh, ports have re realized that they need to reduce their congestions and also minimize the delays at their ports. Reasons are that there are insufficient um, insufficient um, access roads and also connections at ports, and they have already large uh, congestions at their ports. What we see here is that hubs need more than 830 billion US dollar capital by 2030 for total infrastructure investment, and most investments will occur in Asia and Latin, Latin America. In a recently completed survey that the American Association Port Authority initiated, it was announced that also U.S. ports 
will invest around about 46 billion US dollars over the next five years in capital improvements to their marine operations and our support properties. Investing 46 billion US dollars in infrastructure means more than 500,000 direct, und indirect, and in induced domestic jobs and accounting for more than 1 billion person hours of work. The following, I would like to explain also other examples. For example, India plans to invest 60 billion US dollars, including both and private funds, in creating seven new major ports by 2020. Or, for example, Brazil aims to invest 70 billion US dollars, including 14 billion from private sector for port improvements. Here we see different um, container terminal classifications. Investment fields are in greenfield projects, brownfield, terminal extension, and terminal upgrade. And most investments will occur in civil works, equipment, in terminals, IT systems, security aspects, rail and road management systems, and also consulting activities. Here in this picture, we see the world trade froze, and um, we see that the flow shifted from 2009 to 2000, uh, from 2000 to 2009. Most uh, growth occurred between uh, China and EU. So here is most growth, and it is around about 312% growth. And second is between uh, US and China, with a growth of 170%. No, I cannot switch? No, okay. So um, here I would like to show you a type of container vessels. Here we see the segmentation um, of uh, fleet. For example, 22% of fleets are um, round about 2,000, the transport round about 2,499 TEUs. And what we see here is uh, the order book of shipping lines. So 41% of uh, shipping lines have uh, sh vessels in order uh, bigger than 10,000 TEUs. And around about 19% have their in order books 8,000 TEU vessels. Here you see different types of uh, container vessels. So there are four main uh, type of container vessels. You have Emma Maersk uh, class, Super Post Panamax, Post Panamax, and Panamax uh, vessels. Uh, for example, the Panamax uh, vessels, they have operating costs of around about 9 million US dollars per year, and most expenses re relate to fuel and port charges. By 2014, post Panamax vessels are going to account 48% of global container fleet. So size of vessels will increase. So topic 11 is about um, US ports. Finally, I will talk about uh, US. Some facts on uh, U.S. ports. More than 95% of U.S. cargo imports arrive by ships. Some of the ports can receive the post-Panamax ships, but not all of them. And post-Panamax ships, they have a draft of 14.5 meters. So port of, uh, ports of LA and LB, they count 43% of total TEUs, which are imported to the United States. U.S. port traffic is expected uh, to double by 2030, and um, infrastructure, infrastructure, or rather the lack of it, is a key growth uh, indicator in the supply chain in America. So efficiency of ports are important as congestion uh, will be reduced, and uh, in coming years, transportation costs will rise because of uh, regulations related to reducing air pollution and also improving of terminal fa facilities and reducing congestion. So these are some facts on, on U.S. Uh, ports. 
You see here that uh, ports of LA and Long Beach uh, rank uh, first in America. Predicted cargo growth of uh, port of LA and Long Beach is from 16 million TEUs in 2009 to 43 million TEUs in 2035. Uh, the I-710 connects the ports with various rail goods movement stations and I-710 is surrounded through 15 communes with approximately 1 million inhabitants. Tr truck traffic on the I-710 will increase by 85% by 2035. Port of LA and um, so LB has, has six terminals and LA has nine container terminals. This slide shows a uh, number of uh, trucks in service and registered in ports of LA and LB. So more than 10,000 uh, trucks are registered in both ports in 2010 and 80% of registered uh, trucks are currently active. Takes a bit of time, uh, okay. <laughs> so there is a clean um, air action plan and the clean truck uh, program which I would like to describe at the port of Long Beach and LA. And the goal of the truck program is to reduce the truck emissions by 85%. And in order to reach that, truck drivers get financial support to renew their truck fleet. The 85% emissions re reduction should be reached by banning old trucks step by step. This happened in three phases. Phase one was in 2008 on banning all of all trucks, all of, uh, of trucks from 2008, uh, no, from 1988 and older. Phase two consisted of banning all trucks from 1989 until 2003 and phase three consisted of banning all trucks not meeting the federal clean trucks emission standards of 2007. So the Clean Air Action Plan is aiming at reduction of emissions from 2006 by 2011 by 45, 2011 by 45 percent. And the Clean Truck Program is part of the Clean Air Program. Here we see that the ports already decreased the environmental impacts. So ports of LA and uh, LB in, um, so here we see that they decrease already their environmental impact. So both uh, ports are responsible for roughly 20% of all DPM emissions in Southern California. And the goal for 2023 is nearly achieved from uh, both ports. So SOX emissions is already uh, reduced but still challenging, between 2005 and 2010, the emissions of uh, PM10 and PM2.5 uh, have been already reduced by 70%, and the emissions of NOx have been reduced by 50%. So they have already achieved their, or almost their goals. Furthermore, they have um, introduced also the peer pass, so Port of LA and uh, LB introduced an initiative to reduce the number of transaction problems experienced when trucks pick up or deliver containers at the Maran terminals. PeerPass has surveyed terminal operators at the Long Beach and Lo uh, Los Angeles ports to determine the most common causes of trouble tickets. So trucking companies can avoid most double tickets, most trouble tickets and reduce turn times by checking with the terminal's web-based systems before coming to the terminal gates. What we see here is that the local industry around the I-710 behind the ports of LA and LB, there are most sources of air toxins, but also other mobile sources like car trucks and uh, normal cars are, are high polluters. Around I-107, there are in industries like, for example, petroleum refineries, as BP, and uh, one million residents live around, um, along I-710, and um, there are around about 2,000 deaths associated with diesel emissions in Southern California every year. 
What we see here is uh, traffic volume, volumes around I-710 in different uh, sections, and uh, the traffic will grow by 85% in 2035. So we see that the traffic can be clustered in three different uh, categories. We have rail connections, which transport 24% of volumes of goods, and this share will increase in future. 90% of goods from the ports are transported through trucks, and 57% uh, uh, of goods volumes are transported on other roads than I-710. This means the ports will be concentrating on on-deck on on or near-dock rail services and DCs to support intermodal transfer. LA and LB are constantly seeking new ways to maintain connectivity and build for future. And all ports, they are struggling with funding challenges. So this means for shippers that they are trying to get locked into long-term contracts with ocean carriers, and if the carriers are calling ports that can't meet the inland distribu the distribution needs of the shippers, then it's a problem. Consequently, the ports are more intent to that than ever to keep carriers and shippers happy. Here we see the share of routes um, to U.S. ports. So main cargo uh, destinated to U.S. moves mainly through the Suez Canal and Panama Canal. Little share is uh, through the intermodal system. Advantage of the U.S. intermodal system is that it needs, for example, five ships for a weekly service in comparison to eight ships if you would use, for example, the Panama Canal route. Routing of freight depends on different criteria. So, on costs, time, and reliability. Perishable goods and high-value goods, they take the routing option, which is faster, and it means it is the intermodal system. There is the expectation that the Panama Canal and the expansion leads to more, to more reliability and less congestion. Some facts on Panama Canal. The canal is uh, 64 kilometer long and handles 5% of global seaborne and 12% of American seaborne trade. The authority generates revenues and average toll is around about $45,000. In 2008, 1.3 billion US dollars were collected through the authority. Average transit time has increased from 9 hours in 1999 to 13 hours in 2008. So Canal, canal cannot handle post-Panamax vessels, which I have shown before. The expansion of Canal was decided by 2008. Main competitor of the Canal is the U.S. intermodal system. The Canal uh, costs, so the route, the Canal route is less costly highly reliable, but you need longer navigation times. So you need 21 days for the U.S. Um, intermodal uh, system. No, you need 21 uh, days for the Panama Canal and 18 days for the U.S. intermodal system in order to get from the west, uh, from the, uh, west to the east coast. The expansion will increase the efficiency of the U.S. intermodal system by decongesting the West Coast ports, LA and LB, and trade can be faster transported to East Coast ports. Some key trends on the distribution market. I think you are more experts than I am, but I thought perhaps uh, just uh, indicating some. Um, it shows, first of all, um, rising oil prices that they have impacts on supply chains and distribution networks. At, as a result, transportation costs will increase, and shippers are likely to use concepts like, for example, full truck loading instead of less truck loading. It means capacity of trucks will be used as much as possible. 
Furthermore, e-commerce and online sales has led, has led to expansion of distribution facilities of retailers. Retailers use more and more intermodal mode of transportation like ships, trucks, and rail system. And companies tend to enlarge their warehousing facilities and shift towards regional supply chains in order to move closer to customer bases. Over the past 10 years, we have seen that the containerized imports have become one of the most drivers of the distribution centers in the US. So I have, um, I think, three more minutes. And the last three minutes I would like to use in order to show some of the uh, Siemens solutions in this field. So uh, Siemens um, expertise um, starts in the, sorry, starts in the uh, manufacturing uh, industry, but we have worldwide expertise also in cranes. So we have installed bases uh, around about 1,200 STS cranes and 599 RNGs, RTGs. But also we have also knowledge in um, uh, con container handling. And what uh, is very important is the global presence of uh, Siemens uh, worldwide. Concepts which we try to develop currently with different ports are, for example, pre-gate solutions. So developing areas around uh, the port and then allocating slots to trucks. And after they have got slots from the terminal and from the pre-gate area, the trucks are allowed to enter the port itself. So it means there is more cooperation needed between the trucks, truck drivers, shippers, and the port authority and the terminal operators. These are concepts which we try currently to implement in different ports. Furthermore, we have expertise in gate automation. Um, and um, so we are good at um, automatic um, recognition, scanning of documents. Um, we do also damage checking, also video gates, uh, or also number plate recognition. So uh, we try to implement these products in different ports. And this slide uh, shows you the whole, um, uh, yeah, different products which we have, for example, concerning road infrastructure, rail. Uh, we offer also services, value-added services, but also energy supply, security, IT, and equipment. So thanks a lot for your attention. If you have any questions, I will stay at your disposal. Thank you.